Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, my name is David, otherwise known on the internet as David. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, on GitHub, um, Instagram, everywhere as David. And um, I work for a company named Michelada, uh, like the drink, you probably had one of those. And we are a Rails team that uh, you can hire to work from Mexico, more specifically, a small town on the West Coast that you probably never heard of uh, named Colima. Um, but even though we're headquartered in Mexico, most of our clients are in the US. And as such, uh, we've, uh, we've been asked to work with uh, multilingual apps uh, several times in the past. And even though if, if we built an app for a company in Mexico, we probably will use uh, Spanish uh, for, for the actual code. We probably use the internationalization engine in, in Rails to do that because it will just make weird looking code if you mix English and Spanish or a language. Like, uh, let's say we're building a hotel reservation system, then you can't have like a habitaciones controller or reservaciones controller. That would just be weird. So we actually, even if the app is in Spanish, we actually use English. So, I mean, you could, you could do everything in Spanish, uh, but you probably, you probably shouldn't, or you just end up with some multicultural mess, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's just stick to English. Uh, that's what we do, even if the app is in Spanish. So uh, we've done a fair share of internationalization, uh, which is a pretty weird word to pronounce. Um, so it's often abbreviated as I-18N. And the reason it's called that is because someone was having trouble pronouncing it, like myself, as internationalization. So they say, screw it, it's an I, 18 characters, and then an N at the very end. And believe it or not, that's why it's called I-18N. So you can make this up. <laughs> So if we go back to, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about the basics. Uh, you probably heard um, the basic stuff regarding internationalization on your, on your Rails applications, and it goes like this. There's a T function that's used as the core of, of uh, translating uh, Rails applications, and to that T function, you pass a key, and uh, additionally, if you want, you can pass a scope, uh, which can be either as a parameter or just prepended to the actual key, uh, separated by dots. And then you keep YAML files with um, this same structure and in different languages where you actually store uh, the, the text that you want translated in the different languages that you have. So you, you will have something like this. So everywhere you call the T function and you pass the key and the scope, depending on the locale that's currently set, it's gonna return the text that you have on your, on your files, right? So um, like I said, it doesn't matter if it's a scope as, a, as an attribute or just prepended as, as part of the key, it works the same, but uh, depending on your purpose, you might need uh, to pass it as an attribute or just uh, like that. So on an actual application, you will have something like this. Uh, maybe you have a page that has text that you want to localize on different languages. Um, so in your view, instead of using the whole text or like straight text, you will replace that with calls to the T function. And then you will pass the, uh, the key of the desired text that you, wanna, that you want to display. Um, you just define your YAML files with the different translations for English, Spanish, Japanese, whatever you want. And then um, somewhere on the code, you just set uh, the locale. Maybe it comes from the database because the user set it as a preference. Maybe it comes from a query parameter like I'm doing right here. Um, and uh, that's, that's all you need to, to set it up. And 
um, your application automatically does, once you switch that locale in, in, in the i18n uh, object, then it just works, right? So um, that's the basics of how internationalization work. So now I'm going to dive into things that I don't see often, like I've been included in teams that are already in place, and then there's things that they're doing that, I, um, that could be considered like, well, that could be done better, let's say it, right? So maybe you know them, maybe you don't. Uh, if you do, it might help refresh your memory. Um, so let's start uh, with the first one, which is you should split your YAML files, right? By default, Rails, uh, it only reads the, the locale files from the config locales uh, folder. Um, and then you, are you may assume that you have to just bash everything in there, separated by, by locale name, and then um, as development continues, you end up with uh, an ugly, very, very ugly thing, YAML file with thousands and thousands of lines that no one can read, no one can maintain. So it's better if you organize your translations, um, you know, maybe separating folders for uh, a folder for active record and a folder for the admin translations, uh, your folder for device. I don't know, however you want, but uh, a little bit more organized by folders. Even in the case of active record, you can, for example, have more folders, right, separated by, uh, by language, and then each uh, model can have its own file. And that way, uh, if you are actually working on developing this application, you will know exactly where to go to change the, um, like the translation for a specific model. If I, if I want to change something on the address model, I will know that there's an address.es.jaml file. Um, so if you use VI or whatever else you use, uh, you can use command T and you'll know exactly what to type and go there really quick to, to where you're looking for. So um, be nice and, and be organized about, about your JAML files. Uh, but like I said, this is not a default in Rails. Uh, you have to do something uh, on, on, an in, on the application RB or an initializer to actually tell it to be recursive about reading those files on, on the locales folder. And um, to be honest, I don't know why they haven't changed it. I saw some discussions uh, around it. DHH says that it's already a very small minority of apps that need localization. So doesn't matter, uh, you know, I don't know. It's just a single line, so not a lot of, uh, not a big problem, just add that line and you'll be fine to go. Um, the second thing that you should do when you're translating a, or using a Rails app that's in multiple languages is use the i18n debug gem, which is, uh, you know, just something that you can throw in there, uh, add it to your gem file, and what this gem does is, let's say that you have a form like this, right? What it's gonna do is when you load that page, uh, you will start seeing all of this. Um, it's, it's gonna show a trace of how it's uh, querying the, um, the backend for the translations. And then it's gonna show you a blue screen. I don't know what's going on there. Um, and you will see them in the order as they're being loaded. So there's, um, Let's say that you, you're showing that page and there's a lot of things uh, loading from, from the back end that you don't even know because, um, because it does it by default, like Rails use some translation by default. So, um, so what I was saying is that uh, even though, even if you're not explicitly using translations, most of the helpers in Rails are trying to translate um, like uh, the labels on, on the forms and things like that. So, by using this gem, you will be able to see what's happening in, in the order that it's happening. So there's a default, what it's called a default lookup tree, which is what uh, Rails will use to figure out a translation um, on, on your views. So if we take a look at what's happening here, for example, um, this is, this is a, just a regular form with a label and some fields there. If we focus a little bit on the, on the name, um, we'll see what's happening here on the, on the background is that uh, you can see how it's querying. Okay, it's querying for a uh, translation for helpers, label, author, name, 
And if it can't find that, then it's going to try active record attributes author name. And if it can't find that, it's going to try attributes name. Um, so this means that you can have a global translation for all the attributes in your um, in your application that are called name, because that's pretty usual, right? It's probably name is going to be nombre in Spanish for all the models. So you can have that. But then if you have something more specific, um, uh, let's say uh, here on, on, on this form, I don't want it to show nombre, but something uh, a little bit larger like nombre de autor uh, for, for this particular model, then I can do that by setting uh, active record attributes author name on, on my translation file. And then uh, it will find it first, and that's what it, it will use. And if that's not enough, it's, if you need something more fine grained and just for the labels on the form, then you can use the other uh, the other uh, translation, which is helpers label author name. So uh, this gem helps you in not um, trying to make up names for translations. There's already something going on in place, so maybe you just need to figure out what that is and then just put it on your JAML file. And like I said, there's nothing special that you need to do. Uh, as, as you are using the, the regular Rails uh, helpers, it's going to do this by default. So pretty helpful. The other thing that you want to do uh, as much as you can is use lazy lookup. So let's say, for example, uh, it's typical that in your application you have like this uh, flash message that shows at the top when something is created or updated or whatnot. And you pass it as notice to the, uh, to the responder. So if you replace that by a translation because you want it to show up in different messages, you don't need to come up with a, with a name like author created dot flash notice or something like that. You can just use dot flash on the controller when you call the T function. And by starting that with a, with a, with a period, uh, what it's going to do, it's, uh, Rails is going to figure out what the scope of the translation is automatically. And it's going to like sort of propose something, which is, in this case, uh, Spanish authors, because it's the author's controller, create, because it's the create action, and flash, because that's the name that I've given. Um, so, so it just sort of calculated that for me. And I don't have to come up with a weird name. And something interesting that's happened here in the background is that there's also a flash translation, for example, that I could use for the author's controller in general that could be used if it's the same message for all the actions in the controller, for example, or if there's some text that can be used in all of the actions. It's, uh, so it's global. So as you can see, uh, there's a lot of these things happening in the background that we don't know. Um, but that particular gem is helping figuring that out. And uh, lazy lookup can also be used on forms, uh, sorry, on views, uh, which is, uh, this is, this is interesting. Uh, you can just, like I said, prepend, for example, uh, period page title, and automatically it's going to show as author's new page title um, as the query scope for that translation. Uh, this is interesting because you can have partials, and uh, they can be used in different controllers or different views. And by using that lazy lookup, uh, depending on where it is, it's going to come up with a whole different um, uh, query scope for, for the translation. So you can have the same view uh, used for different controllers. But if the text changes, or like, like the title on the page or whatnot, you can just change it using, using uh, the translations. Uh, and speaking of views, you can actually localize views. This is, this is the one that I've seen um, that I don't see often in Rails applications, and it's the one that I like the most. Uh, so sometimes you just have a lot of text that needs to be localized or translated. And it, I've seen people you know, just adding a lot of keys on the, on the view and, and then adding all that text on, on the JAML file, and this makes you know, just, it's just a lot of text and things that can be broken and whatnot. So you can actually localize views just by appending a locale to the extension file. And if you do that, it will just load the whole thing depending on the locale you're on. So you can have like a Japanese view uh, for, for your terms and conditions page. And instead of having it in different JAML files, you can just have the whole view translated, right? And, and have the same thing in Spanish 
and um, Rails automatically would try to load the view uh, for the current, currently set locale, depending on the file extension. And, and this is also useful because as you, as you use more languages, maybe the layout itself of the page needs to change, right? Maybe for the Japanese version, you want it to show as a table instead of just uh, straight, or for Arabic languages, you need to show it from uh, right to left, whatever it is, so you can localize the whole view instead of just uh, the, the, the text strings. So it, uh, you just need to have like different views and that's it. So that's, that's pretty nice. And it actually works with partials. So even if you don't have to localize the whole view, if there's just some little piece of text that needs to be localized, then you can use it just with, uh, with a partial. And it works with mailer views, of course. So if, I don't know, your newsletter needs to be on different um, languages, you just create the views for, for each of the actions. And depending on the locale, that's the view that's going to use. So there's a lot of, of uses for that. Instead of using like ifs around in your views, you can do, you can actually do this. So uh, fallbacks. Um, so there's even if some languages are you know similar, there's always variations depending on the regions, right? There's uh, some words on the Spanish that is spoken in uh, I don't know in Spain versus the one that's spoken in, in Mexico, that's totally different. There's some variation of the words. And even in English, for example, you have the British English, there's some words that are totally different on the American English, right? Like soccer, they call it football. The football, they call it American football. Uh, the restroom is the toilet. Uh, bill is a note, and the shower is the bath. So you don't want to keep uh, translations for both languages uh, you know, for all the words, right? Because there's a lot of things that uh, they share. So what you do is you configure, you can configure in your application.rb file um, translation fallbacks, which uh, in which you will tell Rails to use a one uh, locale, and then if it can't find the key for that, uh, then try the next one, right? So in this case, I'm telling it to use uh, the British English, and then if it can't fall back, sorry, if it can't find the the key that it's looking for, then try on the regular English. And as you can see, it's an array, so it can be several other, other languages that can work as, as fallback. So let's say that you have a page like this where we have the things that uh, they share in common at the top and then three words in common at the bottom. Um, so as you can switch uh, between the two locales, you, you, you will see the differences uh, that are defined on, your, on both your JAMA files. But the words in common, for example, you only define them on the English, on the regular English file, and you don't need them anymore on the British English uh, file. So if we take a look at what's happening on the background, it's happening exactly the way we'd expect, which is um, it's querying first for all the words on the British English file, because that's our current locale. But then if it can find those words, it will just fall back to the American English uh, file. So, like I say, it's pretty useful uh, because there's, there's many languages. I mean, British English and American English, it's just one example. But in Spanish, there's a lot, a lot of variation between uh, you know, words in Venezuela, Argentina, and Mexico. So if you're trying to actually be like really global, you need to change those the little variations. And this is very useful for that. And so you don't have to repeat yourself too much. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about pluralization um, because uh, this is another one that I don't see often or, and it was pr pretty recently, like maybe a couple months ago, I saw, I saw this being misused in an application. Um, so sometimes you just need to show numbers and then some text, right? And when it's, uh, when it's zero, you need, you need to use the word in plural, uh, when there's just one, you need to use the singular. And then if there's uh, more than one, then you need to use the plural again of, of the word, right? Or maybe the text is just different. If it's zero, you want to show there's nothing here or no points. And I don't know, there's, there's many ways that this can work. Um, and sometimes you think the right way to do this is to just use an if structure like this. And uh, depending on what's the, what's the value on the points variable, you just use different keys, uh, different translation keys. 
uh, that you then go and define on your YAML files. Uh, and that's it, right? And it actually works. You know, it, it's, it's not that it doesn't work, but um, there's actually a better way to do this, uh, which, uh, which is included in the translation in the whole I18N engine of Rails. So instead of having this, what you can do is just actually define the keys for points, and then uh, you use the three um, keywords, which is zero, and that's the way you tell Rails what to show when there's uh, zero points or whatever you're counting, um, what you do when you have one, and what you do when you have anything else, right? And you can interpolate in, in the three of them, you can interpolate uh, the count, which will be what you will pass as, an, as a parameter to the T function, to determine how many, um, how many objects we're, we're, we're having right now. So instead of having this uh, weird if structure, you will have something like this, where you call the T function, and then you pass the, the count variable, and it will do exactly the same that it does uh, with the, that weird if structure, but it will automatically handle the whole thing for you. So uh, as you can see, the code is much, much cleaner and way easier to to maintain and understand, so it works the same. Um, so we've been talking about using YAML to store your translations, but uh, it's not the only way to store them. There's different, you know, strategies or what they call backend to actually um, store your translations and then pull them and, sh and display them on, on your app. And all you have to do is just create a, an initializer somewhere and uh, define what backend you want to use for this particular application. So let's say, for example, that you want to use the active record uh, backend. Um, you will need to add a gem because they're not, these backends are not part of the Rails core, but there's a lot of gems to handle different, uh, different backends. And um, when you use this gem, and what it wants you is to have a migration or a table that will look something like this, where you will store uh, the locale, the key that you're looking for, um, and the value, which is exactly what, what's being translated um, on, on, on an actual uh, active record uh, database. So you set it up as the backend, and let's say that we have a form like this, instead of, instead of having all those uh, YAML query lookups that we had, um, when you use the simple backend, now you have a bunch of queries to the, to the database, which is, as you can imagine, uh, not very good if you're not using proper caching, but um, hey, it still works, right? So it's an option. So uh, the way you actually create uh, the translations, it's you know, plain active record. You just insert those records in the database. And it doesn't have to be via console. It can be via an admin tool that you can build for someone that actually needs to be actively changing those translations, right? And instead of deploying a change on the YAML file, then they can do it on the fly by changing the actual database. So that's, that's one of the use cases that I've that I seen for that one. So um, there's, uh, like I said, there's several backends. Uh, the simple one is the one that comes by default with Rails, which uh, uses YAML and some internal caching to not um, overwhelm your, your application. Um, there's the active record uh, backend that we talked about a little bit. Um, but there's a Redis backend if you want to use Redis and it helps you, then why not use Redis? Um, if you like MongoDB for some weird reason that I don't know, uh, you can use Mongo for that if it's up and if it doesn't break. <laughs> Um, or you can use uh, a thing that's called GetText. I don't know if you've used that in the past. I did for a Rails application and it was not quite a good experience, uh, so I wouldn't recommend that either. Um, so, but, but you can use any, any already defined backend. And even if there's nothing for you and maybe you store your uh, translations using butterfly communication vibration or whatnot, you can draw your own translation uh, backend, and it's pretty simple. Um, so let's say we want to actually do a Holor uh, translator. Um, we can just define a class that's i18n backend Holor, um, and there's a helper class from Rails that you can just include, which is the backend base, 
and then um, that backend base will just add everything that, uh, th that will make uh, this class uh, behave as a backend, and then you just need to implement the lookup method that will receive uh, the locale, the key, the scope, and some options, and then you can do with that whatever you want, and uh, whatever you want it stored. Uh, so in this case, we just want to return the holder string for, for um, everything that's trying to be translated, and then it will just work, right? <laughs> everything will be holder. So that's pretty flexible. Uh, however you want to store your, your translations, it's up to you. Um, and it's, it's pretty handy to know that you can do something with it. Um, and then uh, in, uh, complementing that, there's a special backend that exists, which is called a chain backend, uh, which is part of the, of the Rails uh, tool set. Um, and we talk about having all this all, the, all, all of these backend options, but what happens if you want to mix them? Uh, you can do that by using the chain backend. Uh, so you declare it as the, as the translation backend on your initializer, and then you tell it um, which backends you want it to use, and it's gonna go through them in order, right? So in this case, it's gonna go through, uh, look uh, for a translation in active record first, and then if it doesn't find it there, it's gonna go to the YAML backend um, and as you can see if we go back to this after using the the, the, um, the chain backend if we go back to this page that we already had we will see on, on the log file that what's happening is that it's creating the query first to try and find it on the database and if it doesn't find it then it falls back to the to the jam of translation that we had in the past so uh, I did mention that uh, you could uh, one of the use cases for this is that there's maybe some text on your application that marketing needs to change, and you don't want to be deploying every time marketing wants to change that text, then you could create real quick like a small interface for them that where they can go and, and change uh, the text directly on, on the database. It, it will probably be the other way around where you have the YAML uh, backend first and then try to find it on the database uh, in terms of performance, uh, but you get the idea, right? You can have Maybe if it's not on the database, it's on Redis for some reason, and then fall back to YAML, whatever you want. Um, that's, that's the purpose of the, of the specific uh, chain backend. And then we need to talk about how to translate and localize time, uh, times, dates, and numbers. Mm. There's an L function that exists that's used to localize at least uh, your dates. And you can define different date formats on your JAML files or on your database or wherever you're storing your translations and just have different um, ways to show timestamps, right? Instead of using uh, SDRF time and then you know a pattern, you can use this. Even if, it's, if, if you're not translating the app, you can use it to um, do you use different date formats in your app? So uh, let's say that you have defined a default and a formal and formal and whatnot formats. Uh, what, you can, what you will do is uh, go to the, the your view, use the L function, and then when you pass it a timestamp, uh, it will obviously use the default one uh, if you don't pass uh, what format you want to use. But if you pass it one, then it will just go to that translation file and it will uh, format the date as, uh, as you defined there. So, it's pretty useful uh, instead, of, like I said, instead of having to use uh, SDRF time everywhere or whatnot, you can keep your formats in, in a neat place if you use the what, what's on IATN already. Um, and then there's a bunch of um, very useful functions that uh, you don't see a lot uh, used in the wild, like the instance of time in words to now, uh, which is a long name for a function, but it helps you, uh, it, it will figure out the whole thing about how much time is between here and the timestamp I'm passing. And um, for example, if I pass three seconds, it will return that less than a minute. If I pass um, three days, it's gonna just translate three days, uh, three months, and so on. Um, and the important thing is that it's all translated, right? If you define it for different languages, then it's just going to work for all of your locales. It's not just some weird FISBUS algorithm that you can come up for English. 
uh, if you need it in different languages, then it's all taken care of you, uh, for you. So it's, it's pretty useful. Um, same thing for numbers with uh, precision. And uh, this actually includes a little bit uh, more uh, options. Uh, like for example, maybe in Mexico we use two uh, decimals for a number, but in some other country uh, it's usual to use uh, five decimals when you round the number or um, different separator, delimiter, and all that. Those are different among countries. So you can use this function to normalize all that and just change it depending on the locale that you're at with your JAML files. You can define uh, the separator that you use for the numbers, uh, the limiter, the default precision if you don't want to specify it, and uh, it will just work for all different languages. So it's very useful instead of using you know, round or whatever. Um, and then there's a number to currency too, uh, instead of having like ifs returning different symbols, you can just use uh, the number to currency function that um, does the same thing, but also adds, uh, like it gives it a more money kind of format to, to, the, to the number that you're passing. Uh, and it includes somewhere around there the, the unit, like that dollar symbol that can be different depending on, on the country you're at. Um, so you can use that function to give it normalize and just change it depending on the, on the locale you are, you're on. Uh, last but not least is the number to human uh, function in case you want to show the number as text, you know, 3,000 maybe or 3 million, whatever, and uh, you want to show that in different languages, then you can just use that um, helper and just define all those words, thousand, miles, or however you want it on your translation files and just keep your view code clean and it will just, uh, it will just use internal to translate all that text for you. And, oh, almost forgot about this one. This is one that's not, uh, that I actually know it exists for this talk. I didn't know it existed. I don't, um, I'll try to find a good use of it. Number to human size, which will just turn the numbers into kilobytes, megabytes, terabytes, whatever you need. So, um, pretty useful if, for some reason it's called different on a different country. I don't, I don't see how that's the case, but you know, you never know. Um, and that's it, uh, that's all I have for you. Um, I'll give you a little recap of what we saw here. Uh, remember, uh, be nice, split your JAMA files, um, use the default lookup tree, use that gem to figure out what translations are already being calculated for you. Instead of making up weird names, you just try to go with the convention that Rails already have uh, to accommodate your, your localizations. Um, remember that you can localize views, you can localize partials, and this is very useful when there's a lot of text uh, on, on the views that you're trying to show. Uh, use fallbacks for small language variations instead of creating whole language files for, for all, the, all the languages. Um, use polarization, try not to use a, a weird if structure uh, there's so, that code is already in place for you. Uh, remember that you can have many backends that you want and you can even roll your own. Uh, and use those included methods to localize times, dates, and numbers so you don't have to deal with that because it's already there for you. Um, thank you, that's, that's it for me.